We have one special guest of honor here today, which I did not know was coming, but for those of you that don't know, uh, the college got a new superintendent president on July 1, and Dr. David Bayar is here. Dr. David. He's still learning the lay of the land. He's going to see the science lecture series and sort of see what that's about. And that's great. Um, I don't know too much about this talk. Uh, I have Dr. Shelley Ty to tell you a lot more about the subject and the wonderful students who did this research over the summer. He's a regular, average looking, I know, how <laughs> <laughs> I look like one of them too, right? Maybe slightly more than average. Uh, but yeah. they did actual original research. It's maybe published in a journal and everything, and they're not even at a four year college. This is fantastic. I'm very yeah. impressed by these folks. So I'm going to tell you what they did, and I'll have uh, Dr. Tyre sort of tell us more about it. Go right ahead. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little bit of story about how this project got started, because um, I didn't do it on my own. Um, so it involves my really good friend, Dr. Michelle Lum. Um, so we knew each other since uh, graduate school. So that's me. She is really tall. She's about 5'10", five, five, and I'm kind of like 5'1", so that's about right. So we knew each other since graduate school. We both went to graduate school at UCLA. Um, when she, we graduated, she continued on to do research and go into education. So she's now um, just made it to associate professor. So she got a rank, associate professor at LMU. And uh, I'm here at Glendale. I love this place. It's great. <laughs> Gave me lots of opportunity, and I have worked with a great number of people. Um, and so I've always been interested in research, but I just never did really want my own lab and go through all of that hassle of having to deal with finding grants and you know supporting students. And uh, so one day Michelle was, you know, we were talking and Michelle called me and she's like, oh, you know, I'm writing a grant um, and I want to be involved a component that involves undergraduate students uh, working with research. And, go, and she asked me, you know, would you be interested in, uh, in writing this grant with me? And I said, definitely for sure, you know, because this is what I want to do, as long as I don't have too much of a responsibility of writing the entire grant. Um, so she wrote the grant, but unfortunately, um, it wasn't accepted and it wasn't approved. And so we kind of like let it, you know, hang out, uh, kind of fall through a bit because she's busy with her responsibilities and I'm busy with my teaching load and all the LOOs and PLOs and SLOs. <laughs> uh, uh, and so and and so we kind of like, you know, kind of waited. And then I heard from my um, um, my colleagues that there's a Title V grant um, that the college had acquired, and uh, they're interested in, you know, funding projects like research projects that involve undergraduates. And so I applied for it, and great, we got it, and thank, uh, um, and you know, I'd like to thank Dr. Um, uh, Kathy Durham and Tom for, you know, uh, reading through the proposal and, um, you know, uh, realizing that um, the benefits that I have for our students, okay? And so that came about the research project. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about too much with regards to the research project because that's their job right now. Um, what I want to tell you is that um, the research project took place over the summer, just this recent summer, and it's about uh, just a couple months ago, um, and it was about uh, six, six weeks of intense work. Um, they're in class from nine to about... Uh, Nine to two, guys? Technically. Ten, ten to two. Actually, ten to two. Ten to two. Technically, it's supposed to be ten to two. But they come uh, nine o'clock sometimes um, and stay until sometimes six or seven o'clock. So they're a really dedicated group of individuals. And what did they learn? Um, they learn how to make media. So a lot of the times when we go to a class in the lab, uh, the media is already pre-made. Now you could go in and you do experiment. Here they have to figure out how to make the media the solutions themselves. So they have to, you know, this is like, for example, one recipe of a solution, that, of, of a medium that they need to make. And they had to, this is a recipe to make one liter. Oh, what's so difficult about that? Well, what if, you know, they don't make one liter, but only enough for these, this many plates, so eight, eight, there are eight of them, they need to make four plates for individual, but about 25 milliliters per plate. You only want to make that much, not too many, because, you know, the meat goes bad over time. So they have to calculate that. And on top of it, um, I went ahead, and instead of buying magnesium sulfate with seven molecules of water, I bought magnesium sulfate in anhydrous form. And so now they have to figure it out how to recalculate it because the molecular weight is kind of different, so it involves a little chemistry. So the first time they did this, how was it, guys, the first time? 
Excellent. And I was like, oh, no, what do we get ourselves into? Um, then after a while, they figured out how to do it, and then it became easy, right? It became pretty easy afterwards, okay? Um, in addition to that, um, they learned how to use new equipment. Um, I refused to teach them that because it's like, you know, I want to simulate a real lab. So I tell them, open the manual, put it together, and read through it and figure out how to, how to use that equipment, okay? Um, so there's a lot of teamwork. There's a lot of molecular work, bench work. There's also uh, microbiology bench work, um, and then there's also bioinformatics towards the end. So they learned quite a bit within this short period of time. Um, and they also, at the end, they also learned how to read uh, journal articles and present and analyze articles and uh, present a, uh, uh, put all the data together and do a presentation. And they did this all within like about, you know, like I said, five to six weeks, okay? And, um, and they're still doing it. Um, because even with their busy schedule with classes and work, um, some of them are still working on the project still because last week they just worked on two abstracts and they submitted their abstract to the American Society for Microbiology to go to a conference and we got uh, news this weekend that both of their abstracts have been accepted, so they're going to the conference. <laughs> So uh, five of them will be going to the conference in about two weeks. So after this talk, they got to take their test for their perspective class and then figure out how to put a poster together um, and present it at the, uh, in La Jolla um, in about two weeks. So October 5th is when we're going down to La Jolla to present a work there in a poster format. Okay, so, um, they're, re so they're really excited about their uh, the project, and I'm really um, happy to have these eight really dedicated uh, individuals working with me and still are working with me because we're going to continue this project a little further. Um, Dr. Lum and Michelle has agreed to continue on with the project, so this winter they're going to continue on with where they left off with because what we want to be able to do is to tell a really nice story and hopefully be able to publish the data in a couple of years. Okay, that's the big goal. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do right now is give you like a little video a video of, uh, of what they're actually doing in the lab um, because, you know, they can talk about it, but it's kind of hard to visualize it. So I'll give you an idea. So I'm picking colonies from our growth plate with the M9 Rathenkan, which is where we have the Bionami, which contains the PRL27, which has the transposon that we need. Um, so we're picking up individual colonies, and um, first um, I'm streaking colonies into the YMA for the EPS screen and then we're poking that same toothpick um, into the TY for the motility assay. Which one is the TY and which one is the YMA? So I have a mark here streaking for the YMA which is this plate and then we are poking um, into the TY which is on this plate. So I have those signs to remind me. What's the YMA plate for? The YMA plate is to screen the EPS um, mutants and the TY plate is the screen for um, motility mutants. Okay, so I'm just going to pick one colony. Let's go to the same number so they match. Do it just that. It's supposed to. What are you doing, Anna? Um, I am looking at my mutants and just recording what they look like so then um, when I go ahead and replate them, I know why I chose them. And what is this plate? This is the YMA plate and we're testing for the um, exopolysaccharide and I have some um, different ones here. Um, this one doesn't seem to be producing any. This one seems to be producing extra, and this one's kind of weird. It has um, convex growth in the middle, but around it's very flat. So I'm um, gonna look at it under the magnifying glass. What about this plate? This one is the motility on the TY, and um, like this one right here doesn't seem to have a halo around it, but it does have some growth where I stabbed it. So. It has some bacteria growing, but they're non-motile, and that's what we're looking for. And there's another one here as well, just like that.
Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to the eight students who are uh, who worked with me during the summer and presenting you today. Um, so, Janine, this is Janine. She's our last addition, by the way. And you guys, uh, they were really happy to have her because she did a lot of work for us. Okay. And then, Danny, Allison, uh, Chris, Zorik, Rob, Tana, Maldina. So we'll let them take over now. I would like to first thank everyone for coming down this afternoon to spend time with us, whether it's for bonus points or whether you thought that the talk could be interesting or whether you just have nothing better to do during a lunch hour. Thank you, and hopefully um, by the end of this talk, you'll understand what it is um, that we did over the summer. Um, we actually did a research um, to discover genes involved in the motility and attachment of Burkholderia unami bacteria. Right now, I know it sounds like a mouthful, Hopefully, with each of us talking um, in front of you right now, um, it'll become clear as we go on. So let's start um, with talking about what Burkholderia is. Burkholderia species actually consists of about 50 or more species, um, just as of 2012. Um, this includes the BCC species, BCC standing for B. cepacea complex, which is actually a member of that group as well as Cepatia, um, Malay, and Pseudomalay, which have all been widely studied for its involvement in disease, such as cystic fibrosis and melioidosis. Um, for a very long time, the only Burkholderia species that was known to have um, plant growth promoting properties was B. vietnamensis. And if you look at the phylogenetic tree, the problem is that B. vietnamensis is very closely related to the pathogenic BCC species right here. However, in the past decade, B. vietnamensis was isolated in the root of tomato, root, um, tomato and um, rice and maize as well. Right here, um, along, together with that, was some other members of the BCC complex, Cepatia, Cena Cepatia right here. Those, again, are the pathogenic BCC species. But in addition to those species was a novel group of Burkholderia species, which is um, listed up here they appear to have plant associations that are either beneficial or neutral. Um, some of them are nitrogen fixing, some of them are legume nodulating. So those are good things because they can promote plant growth in plants. One of them is Bionami right there. Now if you go back to that phylogenetic tree earlier, we can see that those plant-associated bacteria, the novel ones, are actually phylogenetically distant from the pathogenic BCC species right here. <laughs> see that gap there? So it's phylogenetically distant, and therefore it could potentially be safe for use in the lab and in the field, that we can use it as a safe alternative to fertilizer. Burkholderia unami was actually first isolated from maize rhizosphere by a team from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, or UNAM, and that's actually where the name unami comes from. It doesn't come from that burger joint down at Sunset Boulevard. It's because of that university. So it was isolated in 2001 from maize rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is just the region surrounding um, plant root. So it's the soil around here. It has been studied because it's a symbiotic endophyte to various unrelated plant hosts, <laughs> such as maize, coffee, sugar cane, and tomato, all agriculturally important crops. Um, as an endophyte, it's actually able to colonize um, the root tissue itself up to the level of the endodermis right here. So from the soil, it moves into the endodermis of the root around here. 
um, a study in 2007 actually um, tried to locate and find where exactly on the root um, the, ba the bacteria is located. And um, they did a gus A staining, which actually shows the presence of bacteria by blue stains. So if you look here, this is tomato root, and the areas where you have um, concentrations of blue um, is where the bacteria is, and those are the points of branching of the roots, or the points of lateral root emergence. Um, as a symbiotic endophyte, we see that word symbiotic, and we know that it has both um, positive effects on the plant and on the bacteria as well. What these um, positive effects are include plant growth promoting properties. Um, that includes nitrogen fixation, which means that bee unami can convert atmospheric nitrogen into a form that is usable for plants for their own growth and development. So that's a good thing. Um, another important trait is ACC deaminase activity, which basically has its own mechanism in promoting plant growth. In addition to this, it is able to inhibit the growth of plant pathogens just by merely competing um, for nutrients. Um, B. unami actually has a special protein called sudorophores, which allow it to acquire iron from the surrounding soil more efficiently than other bacteria. So then it's able to get the iron more, it'll grow um, more efficiently. It's also able to metabolize volatile pollutants such as benzene and phenol, which means that in polluted environments, while other bacteria will die, B. unami will continue to survive. All right, let's talk more about... B. unami belongs to the class beta proteobacteria. What does it look like? It's pretty small, at 1.8 to 2.5 by 0 0.5 to 0 0.8 micrometers. It's about one-fifth to quarter the size of E. coli. And it's one of these bacteria right here. They usually come in diplobacilli form, which means that they look kind of like rods that come in pairs. Um, there's two right there, two right there. And if you actually kind of zoom in, this is what it should look like right here. Um, B. unami is also motile. It's able to move around and swim around by virtue of either a single polar flagellum like this one or a tuft of about four to eight flagella like this one. It's also able to produce a capsule or EPS, which is involved in attachment. And unfortunately, this picture of simple staining here doesn't show that, but this diagram um, has a halo around the rods and that's the capsule. Um, B. unami forms circular-shaped, dome-shaped, yellowish colonies. And if you cut through a plate in a colony, it should look like this. So dome-shaped and circular. And um, it should have that characteristic sheen because of that layer of capsule surrounding it. Um, in terms of its response to antibiotics, it is resistant to the antibiotic rifampicin, which we abbreviate as RIF, whereas it is sensitive to canamycin, um, which we shortcut as CAN or KM. What this means is that in environments that contain rifampicin, um, B. unami will not, um, will continue to survive. However, once canamycin is added, B. unami will die out. Um, going back to the title of our research, discovering genes involved in motility and attachment, these are the two characteristics that we want to be studying in this project. Uh, why do we want to do that? It's because it's what enables the bacteria to move towards favorable environments and away from adverse ones. It's what allows the bacteria to move from the soil into the plant root itself so that it could establish that symbiotic relationship with the plant roots. Um, this is a picture of a plate with soft agar on it. And um, if you remember that video from earlier, I was stabbing into a plate using a you know, high-tech toothpick. And this is the initial inoculation point right here. Um, after a certain incubation period, about two days, um, you should see like um, a halo growing around it. And that's indicative of bacteria swimming away from that initial inoculation point. And this is what is called a motility assay. That's how you know that the bacteria is moving. Um, the other characteristic that we studied is EPS or capsule production. EPS is the abbreviation for exopolysaccharides. Exopolysaccharides are um, polymers of sugar residues that is produced by microorganisms into its surrounding environment. Usually this is involved in surface attachment. It also aids in motility because it acts as a surfactant. In addition to this, it is a possible source of um, nutrition when energy stores are low and it also protects the bacteria from dehydration. Overall, EPS, or the capsule, contributes to its ability to colonize plant roots. And so these two characteristics are involved in how they initially established that relationship with the plants, and that's why we're interested in them. In a more practical perspective, if you recall these plates, 
it's easy to observe these phenotypes, and that's why we want to deal with these characteristics. How we discover these genes in particular will be something that um, Danny and Allison will be talking about shortly. Okay, the first intention of the study was to introduce mutations to the Biunami strains. Uh, there's several types of mutations. We didn't do that, by the way. <laughs> okay, so we have radiation. Uh, UV radiation is used to induce uh, DNA mutations. We also have chemical mutagens, uh, which involve the carcinogens that cause cancer. What we used in the lab was a molecular biology technique known as, known as transposon mutagenesis, where we use a transposon to introduce the mutation. A transposon, by the way, is a DNA sequence that is, that is capable of replicating itself and inserting itself into other regions of DNA. We hope that the insertion of the transposon dis disrupts genes and uh, leads to a mutation. So where is this transposon located? It's located in plasmid PRL27. PRL27 is obtained from E. coli BW20672767. <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> it was developed by Dr. Bill Metcalf of the University of Illinois and uh, and provided to us by Dr. Michelle Lum. A special property of this plasmid is that it's a suicide vector, which is a vector in our case, a plasmid that can't replicate in another host. Here we see the construct of the plasmid. Here's the actual transposon. We have the ORI region, which is the origin of replication of the plasmid. We have the canamycin resistance gene, <coughs> which confers canamycin resistance to its host. And we have the transposase promoter. To the side of it, you could see the transposase, which is the gene uh, that encodes the enzyme responsible for transposition. Now, how do we get the plasmid from the E. coli species to the Bionami, from the E. coli organism to the Bionami organism? We do this through conjugation. Before I go on, I just want to mention that the Bionami we used throughout the project was provided to us by Dr. Jesus Caballero Mellado of UNAM and, and also provided to us by Dr. Michelle Lum. So here's an illustration of conjugation. Uh, in order for conjugation to occur, we need a, a donor host, which is E. coli in our case, uh, and a recipient host, which is Bionami. The E. coli initially contains the host chromosome and the plasmid. The Bionami only includes the host chromosome initially. So during conjugation, the plasmid transfers from the E. coli to the Bionami host uh, through the conjugation bridge. And after conjugation, we hope that the transfer of the transposon located in the plasmid causes a disruption of the gene and hopefully a mutation. So as Danny mentioned, there's a number of components on this plasmid that contribute to this process of trans, um, transposon mutagenesis. Now once again, the definition of a transposon is a sequence of DNA that is able to insert copies of itself into, randomly into other regions of DNA. Now what we like about this transposon, TN5RL27, is that it carries the canamycin's resistance gene. And it is this same gene that can be used as a selectable marker. Meaning that when, after conjugation, when we plate this bacteria onto onto medium containing canamycin, only the colonies containing the plasmid and thus the transposon will be able to grow. What we also like is that the origin of replication is in the transposon. So when the transposon inserts itself elsewhere, the origin, of um, the origin of replication is obviously on it, and what's left of the plasmid is unable to replicate. This, in addition to the fact that the plasmid is unable to replicate in an organism other than the engineered E. coli, make it a suicide vector. Another piece, so to speak, of this plasmid is the transposase gene. The function of this gene is to confer the ability of transposition, meaning it gives the transposon the ability to even cut and paste. What's interesting about this gene is that it lies outside the transposon. As you can see, it lies outside the transposon. So when this transposon inserts itself elsewhere, it no longer has this gene to make the enzyme that gives it uh, the ability to cut and paste. So wherever this transposon inserts is, is, there, is, perma is permanently stuck there. Uh, what's also interesting is that, is that this is a hyperactive variant. So it has an increased rate of transposition, which, which means that there's a greater probability of transmission actually occurring. Now we like this because we hope that it yields a greater rate of mutation. So the whole point of using all these tools is to, of course, get mutation. Now, mutation occurs upon the insertion of the transposon into the chromosome of the bacteria. 
And it is with this insertion that expression of genes can be, oh, sorry. And this insertion can affect, affect the expression of genes either negatively, positively, or maybe neutral, not at all. Now what we hope for is that the, muta the mutated gene produces a change in function that can be observed phenotypically. So when we observe the phenotypes of the mutant strain to the phenotypes of the wild type, the non-mutant strain, we can identify that gene and the role it plays in expressing that phenotype. We're essentially just trying to find its function. Uh, so the first steps in our actual procedures is conjugation, uh, where we'll be trying to take this plasmid from E. coli and insert it into our Burkhold area. And the transposon on this plasmid will be um, hopefully disrupting genes responsible for EPS and motility. Um, so in conjugation, uh, we have our tryptone yeast agar plate, which we'll be calling our mating plate, and our E. coli and our Burkhold area. Uh, so to start, we just streak our Burkhold area on the plate, and right on top of it, we streak our E. coli. Um, and then we mix it around to try to get as much one-to-one -one bacterial contact as possible, and we'll incubate the plate at um, 30 degrees Celsius for about two days. Um, so now, what we hope to have uh, um, accomplished during incubation is this. Uh, so here we have our Burkhold area with its main piece of DNA or its chromosome, and the E. coli with its chromosome, and the plasmid we're working with. Um, so the plasmid will replicate and um, become um, transfer along a mating bridge produced by the E. coli. And um, at the end, we'll, we hope to have a replicated plasmid in our Burkhold area. Um, so now we'll be looking at what happens once the plasmid has been successfully transferred into our Burkhold area. Uh, so here we have our organism, it's, the, it's chromosome and the plasmid. And this orange line is meant to represent a small piece of the chromosome, because this chromosome is about 8 million base pairs in length, while the plasmid is only about 4,000. <coughs> Uh, so here on the plasmid, we have our canamycin resistance gene and the transposase gene, which codes for these two enzymes that will do the cutting and the pasting of the transposon. Um, and the transposon can insert itself in the chromosome at any random spot, but we hope to have it insert itself in our genes of interest, genes responsible for motility and EPS expression. And once this has happened, once our genes of interest are disrupted, we'll have a change in phenotype, which we can observe in lab. Um, so a successful transfer of the plasmid and transposition of the transposon is all we um, hope to accomplish during our incubation. Um, and after our incubation, we'll um, spread our bacterial solution on an M9 minimal media canamycin and rifampicin plate. And because this plate has both canamycin and rifampicin, the only organisms that will be allowed to grow on there uh, will be Burkholderia, which is naturally resistant to rifampicin, and um, that has the canamycin resistance gene. Uh, so these green dots are meant to represent organisms like this uh, with the canamycin resistance gene. And I'll pass it on to Zorik. After 48 hours of incubation in 30 degrees uh, Celsius, we will select 200 of these little green dots that are the colonies, and we will use a toothpick to select each of them and streak the y uh, YMA plate and, stab, and use the same toothpick to stab the TY plate. We should make sure that we are doing the same place for both of the plates so they contain the same bacteria. The YMA plates, it's used for the um, for the monitoring of the um, monitoring of the EPS mutant and the TY plates because it has 0.3 percent agar. It let the bacteria move from the initial incubation uh, inoculation point, and uh, we can monitor for the motility mutant. It we monitor for the total of uh, 1,600 each student 200, and we had eight students, so it gave us a total of 1,600 colonies. We incubate both of these plates in 30 degree Celsius for 48 hours. This is the result of the, after the 48 hours incubation, you can see some bacteria have a different growth. Here we have a different color, and here uh, it's a potential overexpressed EPS that it's more mucoidy and uh, they're more shiny compared to this one that it's uh, less EPS and it's <coughs> less shiny. This is the TY plate and you can see 
the radius of growth. Here there is uh, more growth from the initial in inoculation point, and here there is less growth, and we can monitor for our motility mutant. To make sure we have the Barcorderia unami and not other contaminants, we did the simple staining. Here is the um, Barcorderia unami. You can see the, uh, the shape and size here. We have a diplobacilli, we have a single bacilli here. Compared to the E. coli, they are much smaller and uh, they are shorter. We also did a hanging drop assay in order to confirm our uh, motility mutants. We mixed the um, bacteria with the drop of water and we watch it under the microscope. Here uh, you can see the demonstration. You can see here the small dots that they are moving like crazy, there are the bacteria. And if there is less movement or no movement, we can know that there are motility mutants and somehow the gene has been interrupted and the bacteria can't move anymore. <coughs> after that process, we, uh, after the process of simple staining and uh, hanging drop assay, we did the, um, we strip the bacteria in a YMA plate in order to obtain the pure culture of the Barcorderia unami and make sure again that we don't have any contamination. You can see here at the result after 48 hours of incubation and the small dots that they present the single colonies is used for our purpose. Also, in order to compare the wild type with our mutants, we place them on a um, YMA plate uh, and you can see here there are the wild type and here are e overexpressed mutants, they're more mucoidy, they're more shiny, and here you can see they're less shiny, and here is the less EPS, and they're less shinier than the wild type, and they're less mucoidy. And this can um, give us the, give us the uh, sure, uh, sureness that there are mutants. Also, we use the TY plate to compare the wild type with our motility mutants, and here you can see again, the radius of the growths are less than the wild type, and we can confirm that there are, our potential mutants are really motility mutants. So after plating for, uh, plating for confirmation and confirming that we do indeed have mutants, like these here, we take four to five colonies off these plates here that we got pure cultures from. We're gonna use a kit on it called the GeneJet Genomic DNA Isolation Kit, and this kit allows us to break down the cell wall, the cell membrane, and to lyse the cell to allow us to gain access to the genomic DNA, uh, and which will allow us to gain access to the disrupted gene that we want. So after using this kit, we should be left with just the genomic DNA of our mutant. To make sure that we didn't did isolate the genomic DNA, we ran a small sample on an agarose gel using gel electrophoresis. And you can see here on the left is the DNA ladder that we used. And this is designed with specific lengths of fragments in mind that allows us to use it as markers. And so at the top, you can see here 20,000 base pairs, and at the very bottom is 500 base pairs. And it's like this because smaller base pairs uh, move, slow, uh, move faster through the uh, gel than larger ones. And on the right-hand side, this is our, uh, what is supposed to be our G, uh, BNAME genome. And we know that because we can see a solid band here uh, telling us that it has not been cut or uh, disrupted in any way. It's a single chromosome. Um, and so after we know that we have our genomic DNA, we need to digest it with an enzyme. The enzyme we use is a SAC2, and, uh, SAC2 restriction enzyme. And all this is is a six-cutter enzyme that recognizes this specific six base pair uh, restriction site here, and it will cut here and here. And looking at this small illustration at the bottom here, the green line here is supposed to represent the chromosome of the mutant. The red triangle is the transposon where it inserted into the chromosome, and the yellow lines here are supposed to represent uh, all the restriction sites in the uh, chromosome that that SAC2 is going to cut. Now, knowing that we have a 8 million base pair band here, Cutting it into about 2,000 fragments is going to give us a smear on our gel on the left-hand side instead of a single band. And we can look at the uh, ladder on the right-hand side for comparison. Now, why we use the, the SAC2 enzyme specifically is because this specific restriction site is nowhere within the transposon. So it's only going to cut up the uh, chromosome. So let's leave the transposon alone. Because the SAC2 restriction enzyme 
uh, leaves exposed bases, the restriction fragments can easily be self-annealed. We use T4 DNA ligase to ligate the newly formed um, plasmids, and uh, the DNA ligase, uh, what it does is forms a phosphodiester bond between the 5 prime phosphate and the 3 prime hydroxy groups. Um, and this is just a quick illustration. This is not what happened in ours because we had different bases, but you can see here that the bases come together, do a hydrogen bond, and then the ligase comes in and closes the phosphodiester bond. We allowed this reaction to take place at 16 degrees Celsius and we incubated it overnight. The products of this ligation were very small plasmids, and you can see this is an illustration of what the, a chromosome would look like and where the SAC two enzyme would be cutting it, and these circular plasmids are formed from these little restriction fragments that are left. One of these restriction fragments would contain the transposon and thus the gene it interrupted. To remove the ligase, the associated buffer, and the enzyme, we performed ligation cleanup with a DNA uh, gene jet gel extraction kit. We then transformed the ligation product into competent E. coli cells and we did this by electroporation. Electroporation is the use of an electro, um, externally applied electrical field, and what it does is it increases the permeability and conductivity of the plasma membrane. This allowed us to introduce the newly formed plasmids into the E. coli cells, and the, the E. coli that we used in this step was not naturally resistant to canamycin. This allowed us to screen for the transformed cells onto LB plates con containing canamycin. The canamycin in this step um, inhibits the growth of the cells that were not transformed or that were transformed with a plasmid that did not have the transposon. Therefore, each of the colonies that grew on these plates had acquired resistance to canamycin, and this uh, resistance came from our plasmid containing the transposon, which codes for canamycin resistance, and thus it contained the gene it interrupted. This is important because we want to be able to create a library of this gene. This is someplace within the E. coli that the gene can self, -rep uh, the plasmid can replicate and also can be stored. Next, we isolate plasmid DNA from transformant E. coli and prepare samples for sequencing. The gene jet plasmid mini prep kit was used. A single E. coli colonies were mixed and suspended in lysis solution. Cell wall lysed, releasing plasmid DNA. Circular plasmid becomes straight after being digested by SAC2 enzyme. In order to confirm presence of uh, plasmid DNA in a sample, we run it on gel electroporesis and compare results with DNA, ladder, and undigested samples. And purpose of gel electroporesis here to discard empty samples and leave only samples with digested DNA. Also, we add primers to our sample Primer number 13 attached to transposon and allow sequencing in this direction. And primer number 17 attached to, some, to transposon and allow sequencing in this direction. We sent samples to Europe in Operon to sequence DNA and identification of disrupted gene. Also, we use EMGR. Public, uh, publicly available nucleotide sequences database to identify disrupted gene. Because we use this uh, uh, database first because we have DNA sequences of Bugolderia unami, and next we use I, uh, uh, NCBI BLAST uh, database to identify gene product name. So to get the results that we're going to show you today, we had to go through a number of steps to get there. Um, we initially screened through, screened through 1,600 colonies, and of those 1,600 colonies, only 125 were potential mutants, meaning only 125 showed the phenotypes that we were looking for, either over-EPS producers, no EPS production, non-motility, or over-motility. Over of these 125, uh, we chose 40 to confirm the phenotype of, meaning that we wanted to make sure that what we thought was a mutant was actually a mutant. Uh, so of these 40, 40 were sent for sequencing, and of these four, um, 
14 were separate sequencing, and of these 14, three were over-EPS producers, four were non-motel mutants, six were both non-motel and over-EPS producers, and one is a cellular division mutant. Now, of course, we can't go through all 14, but I will go over the, a few. So like I said, six were non-motile and EPS producers, one of which was my own that I, uh, own me and that I isolated. Mutant D15A. And after blast analysis and gene mapping, I found that the transposon inserted itself at this location in the, in B Nami's chromosome, a location where the FLHD gene sits. What FLHD is, is a flagellar transcriptional activator, which is a fancy term for a protein that increases the gene transcription of genes that code for proteins that contribute to the production of a flagella. That wasn't any easier, I guess. <laughs> but, um, uh, and it is this same gene that is actually the complement gene to the FLHC gene. FLHC gene being, FLHC gene being the gene that uh, our project collaborator, Dr. Michelle Lum, is also working on, and which a gene that I also hope to work on this winter. The way FLHD gene works is in an operon, as you can see in this neighborhood, a neighborhood just being the a visual of the known genes that are of the known genes that are near my the FLHD gene in the B Unami chromosome. It works in an operon with the FLHC gene, the, uh, the red being the the red arrow being the FLHD and the white being the FLHC. Now, together, these are transcribed and translated and create proteins which form a dimer that act as a transcriptional factor, which means they bind to the promoter and allow for genes that code for proteins that contribute to the production of a flagella to be transcribed. So, I, so one can hypothesize that if this gene is interrupted, the proper transcription and translation of this operon is, doesn't occur and the dimer doesn't form. And transcription of subsequent genes does not happen, does not occur. Phenotypically, this makes sense because the phenotype, like I said, the phenotype observed was non-motility. As you can see, unlike the wild type, there is no swimming away from the inoculation point. Now, what's also interesting is that this, this mutant produced, overproduced EPS. So unlike the wild type or the non-mutant strain that is very, a, little, a lot drier and flatter, this mutant was was really raised off the agar, glossy, and mucoidy. Now I can't tell you with 100% certainty why that is, but and so of course for the further investigation is going to be needed. But what I hypothesize is that a compensatory mutation is at work. Like Janine said, motility and EPS production are, is kind of what's needed to for the symbiotic relationship to form. So without the ability to actually swim to the to the um, plant, uh, the next best thing would be to develop a, a really exaggerated means of uh, adherence. So the next mutant is going to be mutant B3, which exhibited similar phenotype. Um, mutant B3 was non-motile, and it was also an EPS overproducer. So you can see here, um, B3 did not swim away from that initial inoculation point, and it was an EPS overproducer. It looks um, more slimy than the wild type right here. When I did a blast search or a database search on which um, region of DNA would be disrupted, I was surprised because I couldn't find any proteins that were disrupted, um, any genes coding for proteins. And the reason for that is because that the disrupted region was actually a region that gets transcribed into 23S rRNA. So that's weird. But anyway, this is where um, the trans transposon kind of sat in that region. So I was saying 23S rRNA mutation is kind of weird because it's a structural component of the ribosome. And if you do a quick, quick, quick preview, um, ribosome, the ribosome is responsible for translating mRNA into proteins. So you would expect mutations in the 23S rRNA to cause a defect in the ribosome to make it not able to translate proteins. So the mutation should be fatal. But how did the B, how did mutant B3 survive? How is it still here? How did it um, show up in those plates? Now, this is weird, but there have been similar findings in E. coli, Staph aureus, and T. thermophilus, and some other organisms. And they have many different hypotheses for this. Perhaps there's multiple copies of 23S rRNA, so even if 
one is defective, then the others will kind of work harder to fix the problem. Um, another possibility is that maybe um, the disruption was in, an, in a region that did not affect the functional region of the 23S rRNA, and it didn't affect the function of the ribosome. Um, my favorite mechanism, um, however, is one proposed by the study on E. coli. So what they're saying is that maybe there's a novel regulatory protein that interacts with the ribosome. So the ribosome still works, except it works differently. So with a mutation in the 23S rRNA, the structure of the ribosome is changed. And with this change in the structure, the interaction between the regulatory protein and the ribosome is altered. And with that alteration in this, in this relationship, um, the translation of proteins is also altered, and therefore conferring a change in the phenotype. In the case of mutant B3, it was EPS over production and non-motility. Now, to make sure, um, to kind of elucidate more of this phenomenon, more studies have to be done to clarify um, the number of copies of 23SR RNA in B unami number one, number two, to find out where exactly on the 23SR RNA the transposition occurred, and number three, what other phenotypes could have been altered. Next mutant is mutant 125. I choose this mutant because his uh, its uptake color differently from from YM, YMA, Congo red, Kumasi blue, Kanamycin, Divamphysin plate. When I decided to compare wild type uh, with uh, uh, mutated uh, Bugolderi unami, here on this picture we can see that uh, wild type Bugolderi has dome growth, uh, shape growth and mutated one have concave shaped growth. Also, I perform simple staining and motility assay on the aforementioned Bugolderi unami. On first picture, we can see a wild type Bugolderi unami forming uh, diplobacilli here. And on the picture number two, we can see mutated Bugolderi unami forming long bacterial strands. Third one is video show, which shows how these long strands are moving. Here we can see long strands moving around other different places. When I see these results, I show it to Dr. Tai, and we both were puzzled. What if it's contamination? And how is contamination managed to grow on a plate with canamycin and rivamphycin on plate with two antibiotics? Or maybe it's a mutated Google Dairy Unami, and it shows different, different phenotype, like with long ch uh, chains. And I was facing really hard decision, keep working with contamination and end up with no result at all to the end of research. Or uh, I will have really cool result if it's mutated Bogolderi Unami. <laughs> and, and I couldn't wait until my sequences, mutated genomic sequences came back. I aligned them against IMGER publicly available the sequences, database sequences, and I noticed that actually my transposon, transposon uh, disrupted uncharacterized protein concerned in bacteria, meaning that nobody identified this gene before. And I also use NCBI BLAST, and I find that in another, uh, Bugul, uh, uh, in another bacteria like Bugolderia gluma, it's already identified, and it's gene MRA Z, which is, which is responsible for cell, cell division protein. I also map neighborhooding region, and I notice that next gene to uh, MRA Z is gene MRA W, which involves in cell. Uh, of all biogenesis, and next one is, next to it, a gene for cell division protein. I did some research and I find that in many other bacteria, such as E. coli, Bacillus subtilis, uh, these two genes, MRAZI and MRAW, along with other 16, genes form uh, operon, which is responsible for cell division and cell wall metabolism. And it's explained actually why here, cell fold to separate and form with long bacterial chains. So 
in conclusion, we screened 1,600 colonies, identified 125 potential mutants, and sequenced 14 plasmids. All of those 14 seem to be clustered within a 31 kilobase pair region of Biuname's 8.3 megabase pair genome. And even further, the double mutants were clustered with it, even within this region in the top, if you see right here. So while answering a lot of our initial questions, our studies expose more questions that we want to ask. First of all, what are the implications of these mutant phenotypes? Is the, is the change in motility and exopolysaccharide production going to change the way that Burkholderia onami can colonize plant tissue? Is it going to help it? Is it going to hinder it? And is it still going to be able to carry out its plant growth-promoting properties that it has? Further, do these affected genes have other implications on the phenotype of Burkholderia unami? Just as um, we had about the ribosomal RNA, is that is the change in the, rib the shape of the ribosome, is that going to have other phenotypic effects for that mutant? Also, there's other interrupted genes that their function has not yet been annotated, such as Allison's... Um, that uh, Dr. Lum is doing the complementation studies for right now. We would like to do further studies with these and hopefully be able to um, annotate, annotate the genome fully. And what Dr. Lum is doing right now is a complementation study, which is we're taking she's taking the mutant that um, that this gene is dis disrupted and replacing it with the intact copy of the gene. So if the original phenotype is restored, that means it is exactly this gene that's uh, causing this phenotype and not some random mutation that also occurred that we didn't catch. Um, and further, we have more plates with other mutants on there that have not, uh, that have not been studied, and we can further study these and find other Im important and interesting mutations. Thank you. Um, so as we wrap it up, uh, we'd like to thank the entire Gauss grant team, um, Dr. Catherine Durham and Dr. Thomas Voden. Uh, and we'd like to thank Dr. Michelle Lum, our collaborator, for um, providing us with the organisms we use during this project and for coming down to our lab and to also lecture us on bioinformatics and for also allowing the eight of us to be a part of her project. And we'd also like to thank Dr. Shelley Tai for um, gathering the eight of us and working with us uh, over the summer and for continuing to put up with us while we um, prepare to present this work at a conference um, early next month. And that concludes our presentation. Five, six, seven minutes here for some questions. Any questions for our students or for Dr. Ty? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you guys did a fantastic job. The research, the presentation, the slides. So we're not, not sequenced? Is that right? Oh, it's been partially sequenced, but it hasn't been annotated. So we have, it hasn't been completely annotated yet. And to find out how many of those ribosomal RNA genes, you wouldn't even need to sequence for that. A southern body will tell you that. But it hasn't been done. Not that you guys should do it. So the cool thing is that uh, she noticed that uh, Marina was saying with her mutant, she took a gamble on you know uh, continuing to work with that. And when she sequenced it, it matched perfectly with a region on the anomaly's uh, chromosome that's been sequenced. So that's why we know it's not a mutation. I mean, so we know it's a mutation, but it's not uh, contamination. Um, so we know it's definitely the Um And the other cool thing is, is that that particular gene hasn't been annotated. It says hypothetical function, it doesn't know. But when we search that through the entire database, you know, that everybody um, inputs the database to, to the NCBI database, um, we discovered that it matches with some of the, it, was, it matches with the MRAZ gene in E. coli. And it had, it had been hypothesized, yeah, in also. And it has been hypothesized that this works with a family of genes that plays a role in cell division. 
and in just the, uh, the just basically pinching off the cell to become two instead of just one fold. And so because of that mutation, we see like a string of of, eco, of, of not eco, a string of cells, bacterial cells, instead of their normal shape of the bacilli, which is just two two rods in one. You get, and, and, and they're much bigger. We notice that they're much bigger than the wild type of Gadiria Um So they got some interesting thing going on. Too. So we have a chance, and the other genes that they pulled out have also been not been annotated too. So there's a chance to be able to find out the function of these genes and annotate it themselves. Uh, and that, again, that's, that's super, right? I mean, they get to, they get to name these, some of these genes and assign function to these genes. Uh, so that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Very GCC in the <laughs> <laughs> Work, they have to do more to find out the actual more functions. Any other questions? Is this class going to be offered in the future? <laughs> <laughs> uh, winter, uh, great for advertisement. So, uh, planning to do winter um, to offer during winter. Um, especially for these continuing um, to continue with the project. So, uh, some of the questions are, you know, do these mutants um, affect the ability to colonize the plants, right? Um, and do they, you know, are they going to lack or increase the ability to um, to promote plant growth? Um, and so, and um, uh, Allison didn't mention it, but uh, her the mutant that she's working on with is the, is the uh, FLH mutant. Um, Dr. Lum has the FLHC, and these two genes were together in opera. And so, so Dr. Lum shows that, uh, Michelle showed that the FLHC mutant um, has no flagellum. So the atomic force microscopy doesn't show that it has a flagellum at all. And so we'd like to see if the same thing is occurring with the FLH mutant, so if we do that type of, of experiment in the future to see. So there's lots of things to do to, uh, to determine the functionality of these things. This is just the initial discovery. And so winter, we're probably doing those type of experiments in winter. And then in spring, it'll be open to uh, new students coming in to, to, uh, to either continue on with some of the genes, that the mutants that they discovered, or to start a new mutants. But, the, but I also want to stress that all of these techniques that they've done in the classroom, they haven't done in a, in a regular classroom. So this is all new techniques. And all in six weeks. Yes. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. I've got one before we leave. You said that you were you were bringing in the E. coli and the uh, being the name for I don't I'm not getting the terms right. Conjugation. For conjugation and transposition. Yeah, that's something I was gonna ask you. You had 30 degrees Celsius, nice and warm. You had these mating plates. Did you do anything else? Was there like soft music? <laughs>